Now to introduce today's speaker, Rebecca Campbell, plant pathologist at Plant and Food Research and member of the Beyond Myrtle Rust program. Just going to pass the screen to you now, Rebecca. There we go. You should be able to accept the invitation to present there. Now, although Rebecca has been working in pathology for several years, she has a PhD in ecology and her disease mapping activities are born out of an interest in landscape ecology. We are delighted Rebecca has been applying her expertise to myrtle rust spread in New Zealand. And we are all set now, I believe, to hear all about it. Rebecca, feel free to get underway. Thank you, Renee and Kia ora koutou. Um, thanks for the invite to speak here as well today. Um, so, uh, like uh, Renee said, so I work for Plant and Food Research and based in the sunny Motueka. And um, I've just recently received uh, funding for a, a, the MB Science Fittinga Fellowship, um, which is looking at epidemiological modelling. So the talk today is going to be uh, roughly in two parts. So first of all, where we've come from with some of our observations and the surveillance data. Um, and then second, how that progresses into uh, what I'm just embarking on, um, this fellowship with um, spatial uh, disease modelling. Um, so I am assuming that most of us are familiar with uh, metal rust, but I'll just run through a few sort of key points that I uh, find particularly important. So it was a new arrival in New Zealand in 2017, thought to have blown over from Australia. It's a rust fungus and like I said, wind dispersed. So it's dry, um, dry dispersal um, via the wind. Um, it's has a wide range of host plants um, in the Metacea family, um, and it targets the, the new growth and also the fruiting and flowering um, parts of the, the plants. It is a tropical disease, um, so it does like it warm. So parts of New Zealand um, for much of the year are actually a little cold for its, for its liking. So throughout the talk, I'm going to highlight some of the implications for understanding that the spatial and the temporal scales around understanding the disease. Um, and the importance of matching the scale of our questions to the scale of our answers and putting them in context um, so that we can interpret them correctly. I have a bit of a focus on uncertainty and variability, and of course, uh, quite heavy in the uh, discussions around the data and the, the modelling. So like Renee said, my background is landscape ecology. So I'm interested in where things are and patterns um, in space and the ecology of the disease um, in terms of the epidemiology. And, and estimating that spatial distribution of epidemics uh, is crucial to understand that spread over times, especially when we have um, complex uh, landscapes of multiple different hosts and patchy host distributions and that all has an effect on how diseases spread. So I started with working with myrtle rust um, with the data from myrtle rust in 2017. Um, B3 um, had funded a project that I was to gather up all the available surveillance data um, in its various forms um, from its various sources and um, try and put that into some comprehensive um, map for distribution, so communication of, of the data. So most of the data came from Ministry of Prime Minister Industries. We see they were managing the response this through multiple different sources um, and also through issue equality. There's Department of Conservation and then later on the Citizen Science um, Metal Rust Reporter through the platform iNaturalist. Plant and Food Research had some sentinel trees at their sites and we also had some data from regional and city councils and botanic gardens. So I took these data and um, put them into uh, maps, distribution maps, because it's important to, to look at where the disease was spreading to at that, at that part of the, uh, at that stage of the incursion. Um, so I bring them all together and uh, each month providing this map of all the new um, finds and where it was looked for and also that what had been found in the previous um, time period. 
Um, this switched funding sources um, into the Beyond, Beyond Myrtle Rust uh, program and also changed a bit of the focus on that communication um, uh, toward the to the Māori solutions. Um, and in this program, I was able to do an interactive uh, web map. So it has the historic data and the new data on there with a, a time slider so people can go through there. And we also added um, locations of um, iconic trees, so taonga trees um, in relation to where um, the rust has been found. Um, and this led on to some funding from Ministry of Environment for the State of the Environment um, reporting where we were able to spend some time pulling those data together with their metadata into some uh, in a, a form of a database and also led to some work looking at climate change scenarios which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and by default I became the custodian of all these data, um, the storage and all the information around the metadata um, as to who and how and when these data were collected. Um, so quite a special experience for me to be uh, in that role of um, data custodian. Um, also uh, one of the goals for the Beyond Myrtle Rust project is to link um, between that um, the climate risk map, which you see in, in the right hand side of the screen, with that surveillance data. And actually this has turned out to be um, a little bit more complex than we intend we thought in the in the start, um, because it's very easy to have too much information um, that can be easily misinterpreted and um, used, you know, misunderstood or used for the wrong purpose. Um, and something that I'll I'll talk about in a few more slides is that spatial and temporal scales and the mismatch between how we work out that climatic risk and how we do the surveillance of um, records on the ground and how we can realign them. So just to show you some examples through the surveillance data. So this is um, just the positive cases and you'll see these various colours coming from MPI. That's the different MPI sources. We see their hotlines and their different surveillance teams. And then after a while, it switches all into that um, iNaturalist, the uh, citizen surveillance. Um, along the top here is some heat maps to highlight the spread over time with these number of positive cases for their um, distribution. Um, and one thing I'd like to just highlight is the arbitrary cutoffs between where we display our data and where we've collected our data. So if we set it by monthly, so I was doing the records month to month uh, with those initial maps, or whether we set it by actually looking at the disease dynamics, um, that will change our interpretation and what we see in our in our patterns and our results and how people can use these this information for for on the ground um, management. So it's important to look at that scale and that purpose um, of both over time and in, and in space. So I couldn't talk about epidemiology without having some topical COVID analogies. Um, so most of you will probably remember the Prime Minister showing dots on the map for, for this initial spread of COVID cases in New Zealand. So I took the liberty to put a marital rust map also in her hand. Um, and I wanted to use this to highlight a special pattern of bias common in surveillance. So you might notice the points, uh, the locations of the points for COVID actually relatively similar to the location of the points for myrtle rust and note that one does not cause the other, but um, it highlights this, this bias, um, this geographical distributional bias. So if we've got humans taking these uh, records, then that is also where humans are is going to be um, pr uh, more biased to where, where we get the samples from. And this is important when we're looking at using these sort of data for uh, understanding distributions or spread of, of things, of organisms. Just a few visual examples. So looking at that Remembering that the purpose of the data was to delimit spread, uh, collect the data collection in this first phase was to delimit spread and also to record what host plants it was on. And it was targeted uh, using 
some of that climatic risk modeling for the highest risk areas. So here we have in the red and the dark green is the newer records and then the gold and the light green is the previous records. And from month to month, we have you know new records one month and then actually no new records in the next month. And that's not because it wasn't there, it's because the purpose of the surveillance changed and they wanted to delimit the spread. They knew it was there, so they need to uh, reallocate their resources to other places. Um, similarly, on the east coast, there's you know a handful of uh, surveillance points, but then as soon as there was a positive find, there's the increase in the surveillance um, all around that area. So you've got a, a, a higher search effort. And again, as um, in the, the right-hand side map, as we know that they're in the, the disease was in those um, key um, core uh, first areas, then they wanted to see where it was spreading to new areas. So all that surveillance effort went out into the into the regions. So it creates these spatial biases in the in the data. Um, so one way to look at that sampling effort is to look at prevalence, and that's one reason why we record the absence of disease as well as the presence. So here on the left we have just the sampling, so this is the sampling effort, and then on the right um, our myrtle rust presence, and then um, with these little pixels I've calculated the prevalence, which is the, the number of the plants that had the symptoms over the uh, divided by the total number of plants looked at. Um, and there's a few things I wanted to, to highlight with this, is that that might sound meaningful because we're searching, you know, that, that searching effort and sampling effort, but this is not taking into account the differences in the host plant. We might be looking at one host plant, but finding it in another host plant doesn't take into account that stretch of, of, of time. So, um, and we might have been looking at this, this, these um, maps span roughly a year of, of data, and we could have been searching in, in one place at, at one of those early months and searching in another place at a, at a different time, so there's no match up there. And also that spatial area, um, so for example, these pixels that I calculated, that arbitrary size, they could fall over an area where there was actually a lot more surveillance just directly next door, so we need to recognise that that um, patchiness in space will affect how we calculate our um, metrics of, of disease patterns. Um, and also, this is looking at that sampling rate and, and the uh, positive finds, but we actually don't know anything about the underlying host population. Are we actually doing representative sampling for how many of those um, plants are actually there? And even though absence data really helps us, it's actually quite difficult to interpret. And it also has um, the same issues with that, that bias of geographical bias of, of data collection and training with those teams that do the surveillance really, really can help with that. Just to show an example of, of those differences between the actually genera and species in this case and the regional differences, um, so here we have uh, just sort of the uh, the first number for each of these genus is genera is um, how many positives, and then the number of that were all the number of plants that were surveyed. And if we calculate the prevalence for these, so that's the um, number of positives uh, divided by the total number surveyed. And you can see varying from region to region, we have different prevalence for the same species or similar prevalences for the same species. Um, we have, um, like I said before, we don't know if the sampling is proportionate to the trees available. We have an example here where we have one out of one with disease. And it's also known that you're more likely to record a diseased plant than a non-diseased plant because of those visual cues. Um, so, this indicates that the sampling is probably not um, based on that proportion of trees available. Um, we do know that host plants from different regions have different variation in susceptibility and also the climatic conditions from place to place have, are more or less suitable for these different um, plants um, and the disease and the growth stages of the plants. <clears throat> 
so I mentioned before the purpose of the of, and the method of the data collection. So initially, um, it was to delimit spread and identify the, the host plants and the climatic risk model that um, Rob Beresford and others developed was used to help um, prioritise areas for, for um, surveillance. And then after the eradication was no longer considered feasible, um, different information was needed and different ways of collecting it went about and um, obviously um, not yet perfect. Uh, we don't have that national surveillance program, but we can use it for, for different purposes. And um, uh, and here is where I think, you know, in that initial response, you're using that epidemiological knowledge to guide your surveillance. And then later on here, we're looking back to the data, say, what can we get out of this to guide our epidemiological knowledge to then advance um, this long-term control understanding and slowing the spread while we gather more knowledge about, for example, the genetics and seed banking and buy ourselves time. So that's the analogy of that flattening the curve and slowing the spread is um, using that modelling to understand our rates of, of spread. Now these images here um, on the left is the um, initial surveillance data from the incursion up to June 2020 and you can see you know there's real hot spot that started in Taranaki and, and moved away. Then over time so this next uh, Map on the on the right is um, data since the 30th June. So we've changed the way we collect the data, and also changed over time. So um, it's really hard to then say how um, that purpose of the purpose and the method of data collection and the change in time and how that is affecting. So you have to be very careful with um, how we deal with these data. So just to summarise up on um, sort of that surveillance data and making the most of the existing data. So with all those biases and complications, it's not that it's not useful, it's still really useful because it's the best that we have and it can, even really simple models and a small amount of information can really uh, improve our future modelling and understanding. So I want to highlight um, from, from this part of the talk, the importance of having someone looking after the data, um, someone checking the quality and able to work with that variety of groups um, and compiling those different data collection systems and the record keeping around the metadata so that if we do want to use this data, it is as valuable as it possibly can be. If you're missing all that metadata, then it does become um, effort wasted essentially. Um, just recognising that data collected for the purpose needs to be taken in the right context to understand its limitations and assumptions and use it accordingly is really valuable but needs to take into account those, those features. And citizen science, so it's spatially and temporally opportunistic but it covers a lot of area that could not be covered in any other, in any other way and actually if you use it correctly it can add a lot to our understanding. Um, and it's getting it right so that we can get the best value out of it. So like I said, many data sets have, have bias, a lot of sampling bias, and there's a lot of ways to get around this. Um, you can model the bias directly or you can resample or use rarefaction to resample um, from your uh, data sets to, to remove this bias or at least understand the impact it has on your conclusion at the other end. So with all that data that we have and the information we have, bringing that together into some epidemiological models to advance our understanding for the for the purpose of management is is where I want to go next. So just some general um, matters about modelling. So you might have heard the quote from uh, George Box. It comes I don't know how accurate this is word for word. It comes in a few different forms, but all models are wrong, but some are useful. And it's knowing when and how they're useful to put, you know, how much effort is or how much accuracy or precision is needed um, to make to, to be useful. So there's a, just a, a, a few um, aspects of why how epidemiological modelling can help. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the things that I thought was really important to have um, 
So synthesizing that complexity of information and mathematical models can be an alternative to experimentation when when things are hard to measure and um, and it can also really create new hypotheses of other things to measure. You can dig down into that mechanistic and the dynamic rather than that static approach of um, some other statistical methods. Um, a, particularly for spread dynamics, it can be quite uh, difficult to actually measure this. So it can be a way of modeling different scenarios, looking at that uh, variable landscapes and, and the spread across that. And in the case of myrtle rust, we don't know that much about that spore release and the spread dynamics we do for some other rusts. Um, but it's one of those parts of the model that might uh, be a little uncertain at this stage. We don't, um, yeah. And then also the effectiveness of different disease managers scenarios. So you can run scenarios through models that help us make, uh, have that evidence for, for decision making. So if we think um, of a plant disease model, it's it's that simplification between the interacting components. So hopefully many of you would have seen this um, classical disease triangle. We have the, um, it's representing those interactions between the pathogen, the plant and the environment. And without all three of those, you don't um, get the disease expression. So it's, it's that, that combination the interactions and the balance between them, for example, um, and, and also um, in time and in space. For example, the spatial variation can be in the environment and it's also in that clustering of the host plants um, and those interact with how the pathogen will um, respond to, to those. And again, that pathogen and that plant, how they interact and the susceptible tissues, which also then comes back to that environment where the environment is driving that plant phenology. So it's about um, those relationships and the, and the interactions. And I've just put the um, formal aim of my fellowship down in the in the corner there. It's a little wordy, but it's just highlighting that um, I'll be looking for high resolution epidemiological models to understand the threats from plant pathogens. And this is in horticulture and indigenous systems in New Zealand. So I have a few case studies in the fellowship. I'm obviously today we're focusing on the myrtle rust, but I thought it would be useful just to um, highlight the others because each study will have um, different data gaps, um, different modes of dispersal for the pathogens and different ways it interacts with the host. And each will inform the methodology of the other depending on the limitations. So for example, European canker and apples, it's um, in a horticultural crop, it's a high data um, scenario, so possibly a bit easier for me to start with for, for building some of these models. And also it's in a grid of apple trees. It doesn't have that same spatial heterogeneity. Myrtle rust, like we talked about before, it has a different dispersal mode, um, multiple different hosts with different degrees of susceptibility and in more complex landscapes where you've got it in backyards and native estate um, among other places. And then the third um, case study, is Zylella, which is not yet in New Zealand. It again has that wide host range, but also native and production hosts, and it has that added uh, complexity of being vector dispersed. So if we come back to um, bird or rust and sort of want to start where we, we where we currently are sitting with, with the myrtle rust and its understanding of its disease cycle and how that fits, um, you know, the, the aspects of the disease triangle and those seasonal dynamics and um, using that to identify opportunities for the for the management interventions. So um, Rob Beresford has worked particularly hard in this space looking at the mechanisms for each stage of this disease cycle. So um, looking at um, what of those factors in the disease triangle are in, uh, affecting like the latent period or the infection risk um, and how those climatic variables uh, shape then the response of the disease and, the, and that interaction with the plant. And I think it, it's helpful to look at this disease cycle um, to help us visualise and break down the parts um, when we're wanting to build 
um, models um, of, of these different components and then of the whole um, to understand our, our risk and, and about their inoculum and processes within that disease cycle. So one um, risk model that we do have at the moment is the climatic risk model for myrtle rust in New Zealand. Um, so this was used for helping target surveillance in that initial incursion. And um, it's known that even these basic epidemiological processes, so you know, it's climatic risk approach, uh, can really improve our surveillance monitoring and our understanding of, of where um, high risk areas are for the disease. Um, it is based on, it has a number of assumptions um, to make it workable. It's based on a virtual weather grid that has worked with, with NIWA. It doesn't have any information about um, the, the host or the inoculum pressure, so it focuses on that pathogen response to the climate um, conditions. Um, so there's a few things um, that I wanted to highlight for moving forward with using this approach to, to develop further. Um, so one one was the the average the way we average and um, assume things. So this is based. I think it's it started with it's modelled from hourly data and then it's aggregated. So the maps are produced weekly. Um, but if you have high risk periods falling over that cutoff between week to week, then um, if you average that, then then you're getting um, lower representation of risk. And likewise, when you average that for for seasonal, um, it's it's a relative risk. And those um, classifications between those risk um, categories, so the the low, moderate, high, and very high, how does that translate to what that means on the ground? Like um, if you have a high risk period for how many days, what does that mean for, for seeing um, disease disease on the ground? And like I talked about before, that validation with the surveillance data, you've got this um, weekly output of, of climatic risk, and then you've got the surveillance data, which is very geographically biased and um, temporally irregular as, as well, and how do you get the best out of that to um, be able to validate and um, match match that up with the, with the scales. So like I said, um, this has no host information, um, and it's assumed that this the plant host um, patterns will actually dictate the patterns of that spread and severity, and I think that's, that's that leads to that next modelling modelling phase now. Just to illustrate um, a little bit more about that climatic data and the scale of it, this is from the climate change scenario work that I did with um, MFE and, and NIWA. And now this one shows the change in the maximum infection risk. So this is looking at the maximum rather than those mean averages. And um, also those, those seasonal cut off so thinking about how that affects in the in the seasonal and the end. Um, one thing that we found working through this modeling exercise was that sensitivity to the quality of the climate climatic variables. So in particular the relative humidity because predictions in future climate scenarios for relative humidity are actually quite um, difficult to to accurately predict. And we did a bit of a sensitivity analysis and found that even a 1% change in that relative, relative humidity measure can change up to 12 days of that higher into that higher risk category. And this was particularly key in areas like the West Coast, um, where they're predicted to have more rainfall. Um, so there's those regional differences in the uncertainty and that sensitivity. And that leads us to ask those questions like how many individual days at what risk level is actually meaningful to start or to sustain an outbreak and what spatial scale is important because sometimes in these um, modelling outputs we see little pockets of higher risk and when and on what scales do those become important for the surrounding areas. So every layer 
of these models carry their own uncertainty with them, that climatic drivers and the surveillance and everything. But they they help us realise where that precision is actually required and where that uncertainty is actually acceptable and it doesn't affect the outcome of our decision making processes. So if, like I said for the fellowship, um, figuring out where the modelling is up to right now, um, using any information that we can from other rusts or other organisms um, to help us further this along. And um, in particular looking at those interests around the sensitivity of the parameters and some key questions that um, help us uh, manage the, the disease on the ground. For example, when when is it right to remove a host plant? When will the disease reoccur? Or how will that epidemic spread from that particular host plant? I'm looking at the heterogeneous environments. You've got patches of, of host plants. How does that affect the spread? Um, and also, what quality of data do we have? And is that quality enough to then um, move forward with, with modelling these? Um, testing different scenarios. Uh, for example, if you did remove a a plant that was a rust reservoir that was a source, um, how would that change then your spread? Would that buy you enough time to put some other management actions in place? And what resolution? So do we know, need to know where every plant is or is it good enough that we know that this is a forest that contains these species? Um, and is the surveillance data accurate enough or do we need to be doing more in that space? And also um, that parameter is so the things we don't know, can we get a better idea through modelling to fill in, our, fill in our blanks? So like I said before, my modelling interests are in that spatial side of things. Um, so the dispersal mechanisms, the spatial arrangement, um, but also the resolution of the spatial and temporal, particularly for the microclimate data, which is really important for, for the rust and that sensitivity and that bias around the data. Um, these are just some examples that I've taken from the literature that I think would be really interesting to apply to plant um, diseases. So these are from um, veterinary examples, I think. Um, so up in that top corner, looking at where do you kill or remove those trees and how does that affect then your total population if um, and stopping the spread of disease. Um, the one below that, example of how the density and the connection between hosts changes your epidemic dynamics and how frequent those epidemics are occurring. So that about that connectance um, and where those host plants are. And then at the bottom left, um, just realising that, you know, that, that long distance, real long distance dispersal versus that inter-locality um, dispersal, so within the plant or within that uh, plant community and how we can incorporate that into um, our understanding for myrtle rust. And this is just an example that I find uh, quite a nice diagram that I've um, borrowed from Flavia Ochebove who's working with um, Xylella and uh, it takes into account your distribution of your host plant, your dynamics your so mechanistic dynamics, so that's like our climate um, responses and our that we have for metal rust. And then looking at that dispersal, that local diffusion, and then the long distance jumps and calibrating that with um, the surveillance data, taking into account any of those biases. So like I said, I have a few other case studies, and I think this is also what I'll um, be working on will be applicable for other pathosystems as well, because we always have uncertainties and different levels of current knowledge about any of these diseases, and um, models can account for some of this variability and uncertainty. Um, so looking at that sensitivity of the key parameters, are some parameters always critical, are some only critical in special cases? Looking at um, different scenarios and different frameworks um, and how they work, and also supporting that incursion response, or um, after it is established, can we get areas of elimination by looking um, using models to predict how how we could do that? And uh, for me personally, it's upskilling in an area which there's not a huge amount of um, plant epidemiological modelling in New Zealand, so that's exciting for me.
So I've got to thank all the wonderful people who I work with um, and have been part of this journey so far and, and moving forward. Um, and obviously the Fatinga Fellowship for, for my next two years of funding on this project. And thank you all for listening to my talk. Thank you very much, Rebecca. An excellent talk there with a lot of material. Uh, we have gone a little over time, but we've got most of the audience still here, so that's great. And I would encourage people to put your questions in. I hope that there's nothing, uh, oh, yo, nothing wrong. Here we go. Here we go. We have, um, i just get myself sorted here with my question sharing. We have a, well, fascinating, definitely, especially when linked to climate change predictions from an audience member. Now, one thing I wanted to check in with you uh, with regards to your fellowship, I take it there's no uh, resourcing available to get m more or different ongoing surveillance data. You'll just continue to work with the iNaturalist? Yeah, so um, the fellowship provides funding for my, my time and it does have a small amount of um, research money, but it won't be, yeah, it won't be able to put out a surveillance network or anything. No, so it's what we've got I'm working with, yeah. And it, yeah, as, as you mentioned yourself, that is a bit of a challenge for us in New Zealand, this lack of a nationwide systematic kind of monitoring and surveillance scheme. And of course, when it comes to such schemes, there's always going to be trade-offs. You can't look at every plant in the country every day. So I know it's a bit of a, how long is a piece of string question? And it's a little bit about, well, what do you want to know? But I just wonder if you've put some thought into those kinds of trade-offs and what you would prioritize, say, you know, would you reduce the number of hosts to cover more areas? Um, would you perhaps reduce how often you look to cover more hosts? Because I, I guess those are the trade-offs, isn't it? Space, time and host. Yeah, and hopefully, um, you know, I think at this stage it's all questions and hopefully after a bit of my fellowship, I'll have a bit more of a handle on, on that. Hopefully some of the modeling will help us say what are the priorities um, or we can say actually we can use these data we just have to treat them in a special way and um, it gives us enough information for what we need but if we wanted to find out these other questions we would need to do x y and z so yeah hopefully yeah, we'll find out more the difficult trade-offs for managers and funders to make i'm sure if we are able to get to that stage where we can be more proactive I guess, in, in this field in New Zealand. Um, one thing I just wanted to check as well, I'm not sure that you mentioned for the audience that some output from your work in the form of a map is available on myrtlerust.org. Feeling silly that I didn't double check where that was at. I know they've been working on the website. Uh, MPI have been updating that website. I'm guessing your map's still up there. It should have a link to it, but if not, just message me. That's right, that's right. Let, let me know, <laughs> anybody out there, if um, that... The map has disappeared for you because that's uh, a way that we can all access some of the results of Rebecca's hard work. Now, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, they're flowing in now. Everybody's getting it together after. Like I say, there was a lot of information there in that yeah, talk. Yeah, sorry about going over. No, no, it was good. I, th I think it's a really good reminder of both the limitations of, of what modelling can do in the data that we have, but actually how many questions we need to ask and how careful we need to be when interpreting some of that data, but also how much it can tell us, especially when we got to see some of the playing behind the scenes with the data that you do, um, that actually isn't easily available to the public. Right, so I do have one question for you to mull over while I work my way through the growing list. Have you got any hypotheses for the culling model in relation to myrtle rust? Not yet, <laughs> I think is probably the simple answer. Um, I think understanding about that, um, how much spore, how many spores actually produced from different um, hosts, you know, they have different susceptibilities, we know, but actually that spore production and whether, yeah, whether we can remove that, a reservoir and that should, you know, reduce that inoculum load, that should reduce the spread, but um, that's, yeah, hy hypothetical at the moment. Yeah. All right, next question. Do you have a sense of the incidence level that tips over to epidemic status? That would be lovely to know, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I, I don't at the moment. Um, that's a really good question, I think. 
Right. Yeah, I think as well, it was certainly a sobering reminder in one of your later slides there of how much we still don't know about key factors that are going to dictate disease spread and how much work we still have to do. All right, let's try the next question here. I'm interested to know how this complex process of modelling intersects with Māori concerns uh, around, have you had a chance to talk and work with Māori communities and researchers and hear what their interests might be into what data is collected and how it is modelled? Yeah, so I think that is somewhere where I would like to expand a bit more. So in the Beyond Murder Rust, that the piece of work I am working on is actually under that um, Māori solution. So I'm working with um, Albi and Waitangi and some of the others in there, but I haven't personally been on that coalface talking directly to those iwi groups and that is something that is planned within there and um, obviously COVID changes the hui arrangements but that's on my on my list to um, talk more around and I think there's a lot of conversation in that space um, so yeah if, if people want to talk to me about that I'm most happy to to um, field inquiries and, and have us yeah now, I think um, you did mention that you are going to consider this, but we'll, we'll put the question to you specifically. For developing rust models, could anything useful be obtained from retrospectively modelling other rusts that have been here a long time? Yes, I think I think so. Um, I'm not I'm not actually very familiar with rusts so much, um, and obviously we had poplar rust um, come into New Zealand and I think there's some other ones as well um, and I think it would be really interesting to see what information is already out there for them or you know how that progressed and and how that differs um, because metal rust is it is a bit special that it has you know quite a wide range of, of hosts um, and I understand that other rusts often have an alternative host as well so um, yeah, I think definitely looking at other rusts or, or other organisms that are wind dispersed or you know have some similarities, I think that's really useful. Yes, yeah, so that of course would come down to as well though that data being available, right? There, there needed to have been enough surveillance and monitoring. With, with some Double. metadata, please. Yeah, to have something to feed into your models. All right, we have just one more question here at the moment and at, at this time. Um, of course, we don't really have enough information to answer this one either, and it's almost more of a comment because it would be good to have management practices for people on the ground. Do we remove whole plants that are infected, parts of plants that are infected? Um, I'm not sure that you'd be able to get to that kind of scale, um, Rebecca. Yeah, and I think there's also work in the space that um, Rob Beres has been doing with uh, more that spray prediction for the um, nurseries it's so sort of how do you translate the these modeling approaches into actually on the ground actions um, to the scale of how much branches and things to remove I, I probably I probably won't get to that level because I'm trying to focus at more of that landscape scale but um, that also it, it relates into that sort of inoculum loading and the plant responses like with their new growth and available uh, material for reinfection and that sort of thing so it will be related but probably we'll just have more questions come out of it. Well and it's all very contextual isn't it I mean the, how big is the plant? Um, where is what the kind plant? Of, what's yeah, the microclimate? What's next Who's, door to it? What plant is yeah. beside? Yeah exactly. That's right how valuable is that plant um, to yourself or the local ecosystem? Mm. Um, yeah, so much complexity in this space. All right, well, that's it for the questions, and I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. Thank you very much again for Thank your you. excellent presentation, and yeah, best wishes for your uh, fellowship going forward. And if anybody out there would like to get in touch with Rebecca um, and they'd like me to help facilitate that, please do just drop me a line. Your webinar invites or have my email address there and I can connect you with Rebecca, and we certainly stand by with much interest to see what you find out over the next couple of years.
Now, a video of today's webinar will be made available on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website, and it will also be emailed to everybody who registered whether uh, you attended live here or not. Just takes me a couple of days to sort that out. And the next webinar will be on Wednesday, April 13th. I'm pleased to say we will hear from another program member, it's you, Joe, a researcher also uh, with a background in ecology, and he's practicing ecology right now at Manahi Whenua Landcare Research. He recently published a paper on, and quite literally titled, The Ecological Importance of the Myrtaceae in New Zealand's Natural Forests. He will talk about how he used an extensive nationwide data set to quantify this ecological importance and about the functional traits of the family that hosts myrtle rust. So a relation uh, there to myrtle rust disease, if not uh, necessarily highlighting the disease itself in the next webinar. So do look out for that invite, and that's it for today, everybody. Haere and I'll see you next time.